Ladies and gentlemen, Alex Haley. When I was a little boy, I lived in a little town of which you never heard probably called Henning, Tennessee, about 50 miles north of Memphis. I lived there in the home of my mother's mother, my grandmother, who was very close to me and I to her. And my warmest, earliest memories include that every summer my grandmother, who was widowed, would invite to her home various women members of the family. They came from places which, in the context of a little boy from Henning, Tennessee, sounded very exotic, like Inkster, Michigan, St. Louis, Dyersburg, Tennessee, Kansas City, places such as that. They had names such as Cousin Georgia, Great Aunt Liz, Great Aunt Till, Great Aunt Viney, and others. And they would come there, some would stay for just a couple of weeks when they arrived. Others would stay for the whole of the summer, depending on whatever their family situations permitted. And my earliest memories include that every single evening across those summers, after supper, as we call the evening meal, when the dishes had been washed, these ladies, who generally averaged about my grandmother's age range, late 40s, early 50s, would go out from the kitchen and kind of filter out onto the front porch. They would each take seats in cane bottom rocking chairs and they would begin rocking back and forth. When they all got going, it was like so many metronomes, just rocking. In time terms, it would be about as dusk deepened into early evening, lightning bugs flickering around over the honeysuckle vines just beyond the porch. And they would talk each evening, unless there was some local gossip to supersede it temporarily. They would talk about the self-same thing. It was a long narrative history of a family, although I didn't know that as a little boy. It was not a verbatim thing, but bits and pieces and patches which were told together kind of in a mixed, homogenized way about this family. They would speak about people, they would speak of places, speak of things, and I, as a little boy, didn't have the orientation to understand a great deal that they'd talk about. For instance, when they spoke of people and they talked about an old massa, I didn't know what an old massa was. I didn't know what an old missus was. When they spoke about places and they mentioned a plantation, I didn't know what that was, although after a while I began to get some impression it must be something rather like a farm from the things I heard being done on them. And I know that my first impression or awareness as a little boy that whatever they were talking about and whomever they were talking about went a long way back would come when every now or then one of these old ladies would get talking animatedly about something which had happened in her girlhood. And it would come sooner or later that one of them would kind of abruptly turn about in her chair and sort of fling her hand down toward me behind my grandmother's chair where I always sat and exclaim something like, I wasn't any bigger than this young in here. And the very idea that someone as old and wrinkled and gray as they had once been no older or bigger than I was just blew my mind. I could hardly believe that. But it gave me the impression that whatever they were talking about was something which went a long way back. When they were speaking of people, the furthest back person they ever would speak of was someone whom they called the African. They would tell how this African was brought on a ship to this country to a place which they pronounced as Naples. And they would tell how he was bought off that ship by a man whom they called Massa John Waller, who took this African to his plantation in a place which they described as Spotsylvania County, Virginia. And they told how there this African desperately kept trying to escape. The first three times he escaped, he was caught, brought back, and each time given a worse beating than previously as his punishment. And then the fourth time he escaped, this time he had the misfortune to be caught by a pair of professional slave catchers. <laughs> 
I have since done some peripheral research on that profession. I think it's safe to say that there has never been a more bestial profession ever walked the face of this country. The story went that these men cornered this African who had escaped for the fourth time, and he, in his desperation, hurled a rock which hit one of them in the head and wounded the man rather badly. Nonetheless, they were able to overwhelm him, and then the story was that they brought him back before a group of other slaves who had escaped fewer times than he, and apparently one because he had injured one of them, and two because he was such a repetitive escapee that he set up a very glaring bad example in the course of slavery at that time, he was given an exemplary punishment, or in fact choice of punishment. It was told that he was given the choice before the others either of being castrated or of having a foot cut off and this African chose the foot. The story was that his foot was put on a stump and with an ax was cut off across the arch. It was a hideous act. It was by no means a necessarily uncommon act in the course of antebellum slavery. As it would turn out, it was going to play a very major role in the keeping intact of the history of a black family down across literally generations. That would play out against one major background fact, and that was that slaves had very little sense of that which we today know, value, and treasure as family continuity. And the principal reason that they did not was because slaves tended to be sold back and forth enough that on the average, when those who were of parent age had children, very often those children grew up knowing little, if indeed anything at all, about their parents, which is to say that many parents were sold away from children too young to have remembered their parents. And then when those children grew up and in turn had children, there was yet less that they could pass on to their children. So over a period of successive generations, it came to be that slaves as a body were characterized with appreciably less and less knowledge of family lineage or heritage as we know it. And in this time when this was the case, when this particular African whose foot had been cut off managed first to survive, then to convalesce, he posed now to his master an economic question. Slavery was after all an economic matter viewed in that perspective by those who were owners of slaves. The master apparently decided that Although he was crippled and he hobbled about, he could do limited work and that he would be more valuable doing that limited work than if he were sold away at one of the auctions held periodically in the area. Because had he been sold at auction, he automatically in his condition would have been sold at what was called a scrap sale at the end of auctions when those who were variously ill, incapacitated, or otherwise not so physically desirable were sold for quite low prices as a rule. So it happened that in a time when slaves were characterized by very little knowledge of self in lineage terms, this particular African, by his master's decision, was kept on one plantation for what was going to turn out to be quite a long period of time. Limping, hobbling about, working as best he could in the vegetable garden where he had been assigned, this African in time met and made it with another slave there on that plantation in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. And in the stories told by my grandmother and Aunt Liz and Cousin George and Aunt Plus and Aunt Viney and the rest of them, she was described as Belle the Big House Cook. And of this union was born a little girl and she was given the name Kizzy. As the little girl Kizzy grew up, it was said that when she got to be four or five or so and could begin to understand such things, this African father of hers, every chance he got, would take the little girl, his daughter, by the hand and lead her about the plantation. He would point out to her various natural objects, a tree, a rock, the sky, a cow, a chicken, anything of this nature. And every time he'd point out any such object to his daughter, he would tell her the name for that thing in his native tongue. And the little girl, Kizzy, like any child today hearing an alien tongue spoken, heard and learned strange phonetic sounds. Gradually, with repetitive hearing of them and repetition of them on her own part,
she memorized these sounds and she came to associate certain sounds with certain objects. For instance, it was said that there was in the slave quarters a stringed instrument of a sort which was in some places called a qua qua. It kind of roughly resembled, say, a banjo or maybe loosely speaking, a guitar or something. And it was said that every time this African would point to this instrument with his daughter in tow, he would say to her, Ko, as if it was spelled K-O, a single syllable. And the little girl Kizzy came to know that in her African father's terms, that stringed instrument meant Ko. There were numerous other sounds for other objects that he would point out from time to time. Perhaps the most involved of the objects or sounds that he would point out or make with her was that there was a river which ran nearby this plantation in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. The river, in fact, was the Mattapony River. And it was said that whenever this African would point to this river with his daughter present, he would say to her, Cambi Bolongo, and she came to know that strange phonetic sound, and to know that to him, her father, it meant river. There was about this African something which was characteristic of all those Africans who were brought from Africa and bought off slave ships and taken to plantations. When they were taken to plantations, about the very first act, in the case of virtually every one of them was that they were given an anglicized name. And for all practical purposes, that was the first step in the psychic dehumanization of an individual or collectively of a people. The removal from the individual of the native name with which went his or her subjective sense of self-identity the same as it is with us today, whatever may happen to be our names. In the case of this African, he was given by his master the name Toby. But it was said that on that plantation that every time any of the other slaves would address him as Toby, he would strenuously rebuff and reject it and tell them that his name was Kinte, a sharp two-syllabic angular sound Kinte, which the little girl Kizzy came to know was her father said his name. There was about this African yet another thing, again characteristic of all those Africans who were the ancestors of all we black people here in this auditorium or here in this country. And that was that every single one of them had been torn from some place where they had spoken whatever was their native tongue and they had been brought to this place where it was a matter of necessity that they learned to speak as quickly as possible what was for them a strange alien new tongue English. Gradually, haltingly, a word here, a phrase there, those Africans learned to speak this new tongue English in their own individualistic way that we now call idiom or dialect or some such. And as this process happened with this particular African, he began now with a little wider range in the language that his daughter better understood English to tell her little anecdotes, stories about himself. As a matter of fact, it would appear he had a passion for trying to communicate to his daughter a sense of his past. Among the stories he told her was how he had been captured. He said that he had been not far away from his village, chopping wood, intending to make himself a drum, when he had been surprised, set upon, overwhelmed, and thus had been kidnapped into slavery. And the little girl, Kizzy, came to know that story that her father told, among other stories that he told. To compress what would happen on that plantation in Virginia over the next five years and then further along, the girl, Kizzy, stayed there growing up on the plantation, directly exposed to her African father, to his stories and to his sounds, until at the age of 16, Kizzy was sold away. She was sold away to a new master. His name was Tom Lee, L-E-A. He had a much smaller plantation in Caswell County, North Carolina. And it was on that plantation that within her first year there, the young woman Kizzy gave birth to her child, a boy who was given the name George. The father, or at least a sire, was the new master Tom Lee, which was not at all an uncommon situation in the antebellum South. As it would turn out, 
when this boy George got to be four or five or so and began to ask the obvious question about who was his father, his mother Kizzy, rather than tell him the truth that the master was his father, began instead to tell him about her father. And so this boy, among others that he had contact with, began boastfully to talk about his grandfather, this African, who said his name was Kinte, who called a guitar Ko, who called a river Kambi Bolongo, who said that he had been chopping wood intending to make a drum when he'd been captured, and all the rest of the story as it had come down from his mother Kizzy. In the pattern of slaving at the time, when the boy George got to be about 12 years of age, he now was apprenticed to an old slave to learn a useful occupation. In his case, the old slave was Uncle Mingo, who handled the master's fighting gamecocks. The fighting of gamecocks in the antebellum South was a sport comparable in popularity to say the basketball or football or baseball among us today. And this young boy, it seems, together with whatever Uncle Mingo was able to teach him, seemed to have a kind of innate green thumb-like ability for this sport to the degree that by the time he was in his mid-teens, he had been given by others involved in the sport the nickname that would stick indelibly to him for the rest of his long life, and that was Chicken George. When Chicken George got to be about 18, he met the young slave woman with whom he later would mate. Her name was Matilda. And in time, Matilda was going to give birth to eight children. And now it was Chicken George in the role of father who set into motion what was later going to become a rigid family tradition that every time one of those infants was born, Chicken George, in a formal way, would gather the family within the slave cabin. He would sit with the new infant on his lap and speaking ostensibly to the infant, but actually to his older audience, he would tell the story which had come down from his mother Kizzy. And for that eventual eight children of Chicken George and Matilda, it was something most unusual in the knowledge of slave children. And that was direct knowledge of a great grandfather, this same African who said his name was Kinte, who called a river Kambi Bolongo, a guitar Ko, who said that he had been chopping wood to make a drum when he was captured, and all the rest of the story that had come down from Kizzy to her son. As fate would have it, those children grew up and took mates and had children in the way that things happened. The fourth child of Chicken George and Matilda, Tom, would become a blacksmith. He was sold away in his latter teens to a man whose name was Murray, who had a tobacco plantation in Alamance County, North Carolina. And it was on that plantation that Tom, the blacksmith, in time met and mated with a young slave woman whose name was Irene. She was half black, half Cherokee Indian. She came from the Edwin Holt Plantation in another section of Alamance County, North Carolina. And in time, also Irene was going to give birth to eight children. And now it was Tom, the blacksmith in the father role, who carried on the tradition begun by his father that every time one of those children was born, he too would gather the family in a formal way within the slave cabin, and he would sit with the new infant on his lap and tell the story that had come down, and for the second set of eight children, hearing this story, it was something all but unheard of in the knowledge of slave children on the average, and that was direct knowledge of a great-great-grandfather, this same African, who said his name was Kinte, who called a kwakwa guitar ko, who called a river Kambi Bolongo, who said that he had been chopping wood to make a drum when he'd been captured, and the rest of the story as it had come down. As things would turn out, of that second set of eight children hearing about this African great-great-grandfather, the youngest was a little girl whose name was Cynthia. And as fate was further to have it, Cynthia was to become my maternal grandma. And I told you at the outset how I grew up in my grandma's home in Little Henning, Tennessee, and she pumped that story into me as if it were plasma. It was by all odds the most precious thing in her life, the story of the family which had come down across the generations 
in the manner I have described. I stayed around grandmas until I was around in my early teens, by which time I had two younger brothers, George and Julius. Our father by this time had finished getting his master's degree at Cornell University in agriculture, and he had begun to teach at small black land grant colleges about the South, and we were kind of faculty brats here or there wherever he was teaching. And then when World War II came along, I, the oldest of the three sons, was one of the many, many young men who thought that if I could hurry up and get into the U.S. Coast Guard, an organization of which I had recently heard, that maybe I could spend the war walking the coast somewhere. And I managed to get into it. <clears throat> and to my great shock, rather suddenly discovered myself on an ammunition ship in the Southwest Pacific. It was not at all what I'd had in mind. <laughs> and when I look back on it now, however, it seems to have been part of a meant-to-be series of incidents that one day I would write a book called Roots. Going back, the series of incidents began with Grandma having told me that story in the first place and the other elderly ladies of the family. And then the next thing would be, as I look back upon, if I was one day to write a book, obviously I had to become a writer, something I had never thought about. It was not the kind of thing to which one aspired if one was brought up in Little Henning, Tennessee and whatnot. The way I got to be a writer was completely accidental, looked at in one aspect, and then from another aspect, it seems to me also to have been intended that these things would happen. We would be at sea, about sometimes as much as two months at the time. The biggest problem we had was not the enemy, it was just sheer boredom of evenings when your day's work was done and there you were out there in the middle of the Southwest Pacific with nothing to do at night. There was a running poker game, a running crap game, and other things, and I didn't do either of those things very well, and it just sort of happened. I became a cook on the ship and in the evenings, after I had washed my pots and pans from the evening meal, I would generally go down in the hold of the ship and get my most precious possession, a portable typewriter I had learned in high school to type. And I would write letters. I just began writing letters to all my ex-schoolmates, uh, even teachers, anybody I would write letters to. <coughs> and every... <laughs> And every now and then, ships would come out to us, bringing mail to us from home, and they would take our mail and take it ashore where it would be mailed. And once I got things going pretty well, every mail call that we had, I would get 40, 50 letters at a time. <laughs> I rather swiftly got imaged on the ship as its most prolific correspondent. Now this was playing directly into a series of things that would lead into my becoming a writer one day way down the line from there. Being at sea as long as we were and as far away from home as we were, when we finally would get ashore, you generally some port in Australia or New Zealand, bunch of lusty young sailors that we were and some fairly lusty older ones as well, I don't really have to tell you what was our topmost priority when we got ashore. We would go and we would do the best we could, and then pretty soon... <laughs> and then pretty soon we'd been back out at sea. And now there would be all these fellas who were smitten with the memory of some young lady they'd left ashore, and girls have a way of getting all the more lissom and voluptuous in your mind the longer you stay at sea. And it got to be that some of my buddies, who were generally what we might call, using a colloquialism, the great rapper types, the very vocal types, they were not awfully hot on paper, however, began to come around and ask me, because they knew I wrote so many letters, if I would help them write a letter to some girl or other. And I was, of course, glad to do it if I could. And so they set up a practice, just accidentally it began to happen in the ways that things can happen in the service, where each evening at just about this time, I would sit at a mess table in the mess deck with a stack of three by five cards in front of me and my clients would literally line up. <laughs> and as they got to me one by one, I would interview them about this girl. I said, okay, now what's she look like? 
hair, eyes, mouth, nose, what not. What did you say to her? Where did you go with her? What do you want to say to her now? Is there anything special such as that? And whatever he told me, I would reduce to tight little notes on an index card. And then later as I got a chance, I'd take each of these cards with his and her name on it. And using that specific information about that young lady, I would write a personalized sort of love letter for him to copy in his own handwriting. <clears throat> and it would, it would be something like, say, almost all my clients were white. If the guy had told me, as many did, the girl's hair was blonde. Well, out there in the middle of the ocean, I'd get in some fit of creativity and come up with something like, your hair is like the moonlight reflected on the rippling waves, or stuff like that. <laughs> and these girls would get these letters, and I will never forget one day and night that would prove very pivotal in my being a writer this night. We had been at sea a little over two months during which time three batches of mail had gone off our ship ashore so that each of my client's girls had had these many letters. And we got in, after two months at sea, into the city of Brisbane, Australia. Liberty was declared that evening at six. Everyone who had liberty just flew ashore. By midnight, most of them had come wobbling, stumbling back to the ship, having accomplished the most they had been able on such short notice, which was to get drunk. And they were just alcoholically imbibed. They were just plain drunk. But then, with my clients, it was almost as if a script had been written. Around one in the morning, they began to come back individually, and each of them, before a steadily enlarging and increasingly awestruck audience, were describing in the graphic, graphic ways that only young sailors can, how when he got to that young lady behind these letters I had written for him, that he just met with astounding results practically on the spot. And I... <laughs> and I became heroic that night on that ship. <laughs> and I can tell you the truth that for the rest of World War II, I never fought a soul. All I did was write love letters. And, And that was when I began trying to write stories for magazines. It was how I began, while a sailor on ships at sea, to write, it would turn out, some part of every day, seven days a week, for the next eight years, collecting, in time, hundreds of rejection slips, before finally I was selling things to small magazines and then to some others. I stayed on in the service until I was 37 years of age, when I had 20 years, and then I retired. I went to New York, I went to Greenwich Village, rented a room in a basement, and there I began to have a very rough time trying to make it as a full-time freelance writer. It would come to be in time, however, I began to get assignments from the Reader's Digest on a fairly regular basis, and I would do biographical articles for them. And then, in a big switch, I went over from the Reader's Digest to Playboy, where I happened to begin the feature called the Playboy Interviews. The first of them, who would interest you probably to know, was when I was given an assignment to do an article about the great genius jazz trumpeter Miles Davis. And I was having a great deal of problem with that story, and the main reason for it was that Miles talked so little. One day I was talking with a friend of his, and it was brought out to me that Miles was as good a cook as he is a trumpeter. And the thing came to pass that I just had a hard time getting him to say anything. To give you an example, if you were home and a friend of Miles, one afternoon, say around 6.30, your phone would ring, and you'd pick it up and say hello, and a voice would come over and say, Chili, and hang up. And <laughs> the translation of that was that Miles had cooked chili, and that you should come over that evening and have some. <laughs> The third interview that I did for Playboy, I believe it was third or maybe the fourth, was of Malcolm X. 
at a time when Malcolm was just coming into major prominence in the national periodicals and newspapers. When an interview of him appeared, among its readers was a book publisher who asked Malcolm if he would be willing to tell his life in book-length detail. Malcolm was hesitant at first, but he finally agreed that he would. And then, because I believe Malcolm associated me as the black writer who probably was affiliated more with major national magazine stories, he asked me if I would be willing to work with him on this book. I was pleased, honored, flattered to do so. And I would spend the next two years with Malcolm X, the first year interviewing him very exhaustively, the second year taking all that interview material, putting it out first in a very exacting chronology, breaking it up into what seemed to be logical chapter sections, and then studying each of those sections very intensively, and then writing vicariously first person as if I were he, a manuscript which hopefully would sound as if Malcolm had just sat down across a table and was trying to tell a reader his life as best he could recall it from earliest days. When the manuscript was finished, I went back down and worked with Malcolm. I was by now living upstate New York and worked with him in a hotel. And he went across from first page to last, making this or that editing change with his favorite ballpoint pen and at the bottom of each page putting his MX. And then he said to me, I don't think I'm going to live to read this in print. Malcolm proved to be very prophetic because it was less than two weeks later he was shot to death in the Audubon Ballroom. And the following morning after that, I sat down and began the most traumatic writing I have ever done in my life calling forth as best I could reminiscings of having met and worked with this man, anecdotes and insights into him, put together in some kind of tumbling chronology. And that is that part which now appears at the end of that book called the epilogue. And the autobiography of Malcolm X was concluded and on its way into print. At that time, I had stepped into a period that most writers of books are familiar with, it's said that writing a book is like having a baby, and I think it's not a bad analogy. Something you've been very, very close with, you have indeed internalized, and all of a sudden, it's gone. And you, the writer, feel a void, a vacuum, and you don't quite know what to do with yourself. And it was in that situation now that a magazine gave me an assignment that took me to Washington, D.C. And I had interviewed someone a Saturday morning and then the afternoon came and I had nothing particular to do. And I was down in an area of that city near the National Archives. I had never been in the building. I knew, of course, that it symbolized history. And I don't know what, but just some impulse sent me up those steep stairs. And I got into the lobby area, looked around, walked around, looking at the displays they have all the time of historical documents of one or another nature under glass there in the lobby. And then I went on up in the service area. And a young man came up to me at a desk and asked if he could help me. And it kind of startled me because I really hadn't been expecting him to walk over there. And when he asked me, I wasn't about to tell him what I really had had kind of kicking around in my head for a while. I wasn't going to say to him, I'm kind of curious about some slaves I've heard about from my grandmother when I was a boy. I said to him instead, I wonder if I might see the census record for Alamance County, North Carolina in the year 1870. And he said that I could. Now the reason I asked about that specific record was because it was the first census following the Civil War and I knew that it was the first census in which black people had been listed by their names. Previous to this time, black people had been recorded in something called the slave schedule. The top of it would contain the name of their master, and then if he, say, for instance, of talk had five slaves, there would be five X's in a vertical line, and to the right of each X, age, and so forth, they would describe that slave, but no name was given. Anyway, the young man said I could see these records in microfilm, and I went on up in the microfilm room. The records were delivered in the little cardboard boxes that they deliver this in. And I began threading microfilm into a machine, looking through the scope. And I'm looking down upon rows of lines of names after names after names of people long gone. 
There was a name, there was age, and some little identifying thing about them. And as I would turn the handle, it seemed to me almost mystic. These names in the handwriting of a census enumerator, 1870, where the Fs look like Ss, and so that old-fashioned handwriting, which we've all seen, you have to kind of accustom yourself to reading it. And it began to dawn on me that each of these lines was somebody, some human being, who had lived out a life. Some of them you could see by their birth age, they had lived long lives. Some had lived short lives, one thing or another. Sometimes you saw where children, little children, had passed away in the course of a record, things like that. And what got to me was the feeling that they were moving along, walking. If I turned the handle slowly, they went in slow, stately tread. If I turned the handle more rapidly, they seemed to sprint along. And the thing just intrigued me, and I kept on doing it. And after, I'd say, about an hour, intriguing though it was, it had just gotten monotonous. And I decided I would just get up and leave, go on out. And thus I got up and started out of the archives. To this day, it gives me the quivers to reflect upon how easily I might have gone on out of that National Archives building and gotten back out on the sidewalk, and I'm sure if I had, I would never have given it another thought. But what happened, again, I think one of these meant-to-be things, was that in leaving, I happened to take a route that took me through a room where they do genealogical reading. And as I walked through this room, I had been in many libraries in my life. I caught my peripheral vision, caught something I'd never seen before. You know, we've all been in libraries lots, and you know how people in libraries loll back. We're trying to be comfortable as much as at ease as we can as we read whatever we have. But what I picked up as I went through this room was that everybody in that room was bent raptly, intently over the table, whatever they had and they were studying with the most careful, intensive effort, whatever they had. Some of those people had magnifying glasses in their hands, and they were going line by line, poring over this copy. And I could see that the documents they had were old things. They were letters, they were ledgers, they were scrolls, things of this nature. And somehow, a thought just came to me rather as a bubble might rise in a glass of water. And it was, these people are trying to find out who they are. And with that, I just kind of turned around and went back up into the microfilm room where I had been to start with. And the thing then was that the people hadn't moved my materials, and I began to thread them into the machine and turn the handle again and look. And I guess I had gone about another hour when I suddenly found myself looking down upon Tom Murray, blacksmith, under a column headed color B for black, his age. Right beneath his name was Irene, his wife, M for mulatto, and then her age. And then there were their children, their oldest children. And I found myself recognizing names I'd heard about long time ago, but it didn't seem really to focus and hit on me until I got to the youngest of those children was one whose name was Elizabeth, and she was age six on this record at this time. And it suddenly dawned on me, for God's sakes, that's Aunt Liz. I used to play with her long gray hair on Grandma's front porch. And the thing just galvanized me to realize what I was looking at. And what really got to me when I got to thinking about it was these are Grandma's words. These are Grandma's stories. And it wasn't that I had not believed my Grandma, because you didn't not believe my Grandma. But... <laughs> But the point was that there were the stories she had told in the National Archives on microfilm in official United States records housed in the same building that the, kept the original Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and so forth. And the thing was something that just made me start taking notes 
very brief notes of what the records were, which roll of microfilm, where it was to be found on that roll. And I made my way on back to New York. And the more I thought about that thing, the more my mind went back to where I had first heard all this from Grandma and from all those old great aunts on the front porch in Henning. And now that I began to think of them, I began to realize what I'd known all the time, but never in a collective way, that with a single exception, all but one were dead. The only one that survived, the last survivor of those old ladies, was one whom we used to call Cousin Georgia. What I particularly remembered about Cousin Georgia was that she was the youngest among them. She was about 20 odd years my grandmother's junior, and I remembered also that Cousin Georgia was the one whose mouth ran like a trap hammer. You could hardly believe the way that lady talked, but they would never really let her get loose. They would always drown her out. They would say something collectively like, now you just be quiet because we know the story better than you, and we'll tell it and you listen. And she would get sputtering with indignation. Now, however, she was the only one left and I knew that she was still alive, I'd heard this, and in my family, as in most families, there is somebody who knows where every cousin is. In my family, it's my immediate younger brother, George, and I called him, and he said, yes, yeah, she's in Kansas City on Everett Avenue. And so I had this driving compulsion to see Cousin George. And I got on a plane, and I flew to Kansas City, and I never will forget the most moving experience it was that after the initial huggings and the kissings and the boy you done growed up good, <laughs> the, minute, the minute that I told Cousin Georgia, spoke to her about the story, she was off and running as if we'd been sitting on that front porch the previous afternoon. She said, yeah, boy, that African, he say his name was Kente. He called the guitar cold. He called the river Canby Belongo. He say he was chopping wood for to make himself a drum when they cost him and all the rest of the story told in her own colorful way. It was like echoes from boyhood. A difference was I was no longer a little boy just sitting behind my grandmother's chair ingesting the story, but I was now at least a fledgling writer and I was taking notes of everything she said as best I could. And when Cousin Georgia finished, in the way that elderly people often can, she said something that would later become extremely meaningful to me. It was at this time extremely motivational to me. She looked at me and she said something about those who had been on that front porch with her and me. She spoke of them not as if they were dead, as I had been tending to think of them, but rather as if they maybe had just walked off stage somewhere behind a curtain or up in a balcony somewhere. She said, boy, your sweet grandma and all the rest of them, they sitting up there watching you. Now you get on out of here and do what you got to do. It was vague, it was amorphous, and yet it was supremely driving as a force. I didn't know quite how to translate it, but I went on back to New York, and the more I got to thinking about it, what is it I have, quote, got to do? And I got to thinking, of course, about the story. That was the trunk, the genesis of it all. And it seemed to me that the clues to doing something lay in those strange phonetic sounds always attributed to that African, speaking to his daughter, telling her the identification of things. And the more I thought about it, the seeming thing I had to do was get to lots of Africans because many tongues were spoken in Africa. These sounds were obviously fragments of some tongue. Living in New York, I began to do what seemed to be natural to me. I began to go up to the United Nations lobby about quitting time. People were rushing off the elevators, rushing to get home. It was not hard to spot Africans. And every time I could, I'd stop one and I'd tell him my little sounds. I suppose in a couple weeks I'd stopped a couple dozen Africans, each and every one of which took a quick look, quick listen, and took off. And I can understand that with me trying to tell them some alleged African sounds in a Tennessee accent. That wasn't going to get it. 
I have a friend, a master researcher, his name George Sims, who knew what I was trying to do, and he came up to me with a listing of people who in the academic world are known for their knowledge of African linguistics. I looked at the little thumbnail notes that he had with each one of them, and the one who intrigued me was a man born and reared in Belgium, partially educated there, then we had moved to England. He had attended the University of London, and he had done finally his graduate work at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Then what particularly impressed me was he had done postdoctoral work living in African villages, studying the tongues that spoken there, and then writing a book in French originally called La Tradition Orale. It was the oral tradition. And I found a man was in this country. His name, Dr. Jan Van Sina. He was at the University of Wisconsin. And I just felt this tremendous compulsion to see this man. I got on the phone, person to person, and after a while I'm talking with him. He was a little puzzled by what I was trying to convey, but he was gracious. He said he'd be glad to talk with me. And it was one Thursday that I got on a plane in New York, curious about a few phonetic sounds, some syllables that had been passed down across generations of my maternal family and with no idea in the world what I was about to get into. That evening in the Vancina's living room, I sat with him and I told him everything that I could muster about this story, every shred, every nuance of it. And it went on for quite a time. And then Dr. Vancina, oral historian that he is, began to question me. He was particularly interested in the physical transmission of the story from one to the next generation. And it drew late, and he asked if I'd spend the night at their home, and I was happy to do that. And then the following morning, when I looked back upon it, it seems to me like miracle too. Dr. Vancina came down before breakfast. He had a very serious expression on his face, and he said, I wanted to sleep on it. Then he told me he already had been on the telephone with colleagues of his, like the eminent Africanist Dr. Philip Curtin, others, and they felt it certain that the collective sounds which had been kept down across the generations of my family represented the Mandinka tongue. I had never heard the word. I was told now that was the sound, or the tongue rather, spoken by Mandingo people. And then he began to guess translate. He said that there was a sound that meant cow or cattle. Another meant the baobab tree, generic in West Africa. He came finally to the sound I had told him, as had been the case, that they had said that this African always would point to this stringed instrument and say, ko. And I was told now that almost surely this related to an instrument old in the Mandingo culture called the kora. He came finally to the most involved of the sounds which had been passed down across the generations. I had told him, as had been the case, that this African, they had said always, in Spotsylvania County, Virginia, would point to a river, the Mattapani River, with his daughter in tow, and say to her, Kambi Bolongo. And I was told now that in Mandinka, without question, the word Bolongo translated to large, moving, running stream, such as a river, and that preceded by the word Kambi, it very probably meant Gambia River. I had never heard of such a place. It was a work of short order for Dr. Van Sina to point out to me on a map the Gambia, a long, narrow country midway down the West African coast, jutting into Senegal, bordered on three sides by Senegal, fronting on the ocean, bisected by the Gambia River. And I just had all of a sudden this enormous compulsion to go to that place in Africa. But at the same time, it was an ambivalent kind of feeling because I didn't know, I hadn't thought about Africa, and I really, you don't just pop up in Africa, and I didn't know what to do.
I knew I had to find somebody to help me, shepherd me, go with me. I finally wound up in Washington again in uh, various lists I could find at the State Department who referred me to various embassies, and I found that there were a considerable number, several thousands of African students in this country. And then I found that at that time, from that tiny country called the Gambia, there were exactly 12. And the one who physically was closest to me was at a place called Hamilton College in upstate New York, Clinton, New York. His name was Ibu Manga. I got to that campus one Thursday afternoon around 3.30 and practically snatched Ibu Manga out of an economics class. <laughs> it took a while before I was able to get visas and stuff together and then to get us on Pan American. And we flew to Dakar, Senegal. And then we got a light plane and flew over to Yundum, which serves the Gambia. We got in a van and went to the city of Bathurst, it was called at the time. Now it's Banjo, the capital city of the Gambia. Ibu Manga took me to his home. His father, Al-Haji Malik Manga, the people in that section are predominantly Muslim historically and today. Al-Haji Manga was most hospitable, and he, when he spoke with me, he got together three men whom he knew to be very knowledgeable of the history of the country, and I met with those men in the lounge of the little Atlantic Hotel. And there they sat in their robes, their pillbox hats, their shoes that with the, the toe kind of turns up and the heel is out. And I'm telling them, as I had told Dr. Van Cena, every shred, every nuance of that story which I first had heard as a little boy on a Western Tennessee front porch. And these Africans listened most intently. When I finish with the story, it again gives me the quivers to reflect upon how tissue thin at times have been the hinges on which this whole adventure has swung. Because what these Africans reacted to was of that whole story a mere two syllables. They said, now there may be significance that your forefather said his name was Kinte. I said there was nothing more clear in the whole of the story or explicit than the pronunciation of his name. And they said, well, now look here. In our country, our oldest villages tend to be named for those families, those clans, which settled those villages centuries ago. And they got a little map and showed me, look, here is the village of Kinte Kunda. And another, here's the village of Kinte Kunda Jane Ya, and some other places with a Kinte prefix. Then they told me something of which I had never had the slightest dream, not the slightest comprehension. They told me how history has been kept for centuries in Africa. They told me about the existence of very old men who are called griots. It's spelled G-R-I-O-T-S. As they described them, griots seem to be like walking, living archives. They told me of men who are in a line of griots. The senior griot would be about late 60s, early 70s. Beneath him would be men at about decade intervals younger, down to a teenage boy. And that the boy would grow on up, mature, hearing the story of a large family clan told over and again until he began to tell parts of it, and a little more and a little more, until that boy one day hopefully would be the senior griot able to talk for sometimes in some big family cases as much as two days without once repeating himself, telling in the most meticulous detail, in great, great microscopic detail, the story of a clan over a period of century or more. And when I heard such a thing, I was just staggered. And then they explained to me why I was so staggered. They said that I had come from this culture here where we live, where, as they put it, we have become so conditioned by the, quote, crutch of print that we have almost forgotten what the human memory is capable of if, in fact, it is trained to know such things. And then these men told me that my forefather, having insisted that his name was Kente, they would see what they could do to help me. And I came back to this country enormously bewildered. I just didn't know what to make of it. I was 
confused because the people whom I had met there in Africa were so at odds with all I had ever had as my own impressions of Africa and its peoples and its culture. Like most of us here, my whole or uh, my main impressions of Africa, of the physically second largest continent on the face of Earth, had been derived from Tarzan, from Jungle Jim, or things of that nature. And seriously, that was really the most I knew. And I was confused, and it seemed now I had to learn more. And I began a voracious period of reading. Everything I could lay my hands on about Africa, West Africa, particular circus slavery. I can remember reading all day until my eyes hurt, and then sitting on the edge of my bed at night, looking at a map of Africa, studying how the countries interrelated physically, one against the other, within the other, so forth. And weeks passed, and then a letter came that I should come back as soon as I could. I wanted very much to come back, but I didn't have any money. I didn't have any way to get any money that I could see, certainly not the kind of money that involved going back. I had spent everything I had and could borrow on short notice to make the first trip. And I got to thinking now, I remembered something, that when I had been working at the Reader's Digest, one day at a kind of social gathering there, among the people present had been Mrs. DeWitt Wallace, the co-founder, or one of the two co-founders with her husband, Mr. Wallace. And Mrs. Wallace had commended me for an article I had written. It was one of the unforgettable characters, which I had written about an old cook under whom I had worked in the Coast Guard. His name was Scotty, an old sea dog type. And when she finished commending me, as she was leaving, she just had said to me, if I can ever be of help to you, let me know. And I'd never forgotten that. <laughs> And now I sat down and I wrote a rather embarrassed letter to Mrs. Wallace explaining as best I could what was obviously a nebulous thing, the hope that maybe I might be able to make some connection in Africa based on a story told in West Tennessee in boyhood. It sounded so nebulous I was really embarrassed to send the letter. But as it turned out, Mrs. Wallace did remember, and she got in touch with some of the editors at the Reader's Digest, and they got hold of me, and I was asked to come up, and I did go, and at lunch, I was supposed to talk an hour about my idea. I talked nonstop for about three hours. It just poured out of me. And I never will forget that afternoon, those editors said to me, we will gamble with you, or we will gamble on you. And they agreed that the Reader's Digest would support my travel expenses, and give me a stipend per month for a year to see what could I do in the course of that year. And thus, I went back to the Gambia. The same men with whom I had previously talked told me matter-of-factly that there was now found in a backcountry village an old Rio knowledgeable of the Kinte clan story. When I heard that, I was ready to have a fit. Where is he? And they said, he's in his village. And I would have expected here as an American magazine writer, they'd have had him there with a PR man for me to talk to. <laughs> but I discovered now if I was to see him, I was going to have to do something I had never dreamed would fall my lot, and that was get together a kind of modified safari. It took me three days to rent a launch to get up river, a lorry, and Land Rover to get supplies by a roundabout land route there, and finally to hire a total of 14 people, three interpreters, one each expert in the Wolof, the Jola, and the Mandinka tongues. They said we'd meet in different places along the way. Four musicians, because they told me in the back country these old men would not talk without music in the background. And, <laughs> <coughs> and bearers and so forth. And we headed up the Gambia River on a morning, vibrating in a little launch called the Badibu. And we now head on as our destination, this village called Jufere, and we got to a village called El Brida, and there we set shore, went ashore, and then by and on foot, we were headed toward that village, Jufere, where it was said this old man, the griot, lived. When we got to that village, near it, the little children, 
playing on the perimeter of the village, gave the alert. And the people came hustling out of the village. It's a very small village, only about 70 people. And as they rushed toward me, I had entered into something that is described as the peak experience. It is that which emotionally one experiences that nothing ever in the rest of your life can transcend. And I feel certain that is what was my experience that morning in that village. When the people came, I saw among them a short man, compactly built, an off-white robe, a pillbox hat, and when they got closer, the interpreters with me, sure enough, went to him, and meanwhile, the 70-odd people of this little village came rushing toward me. They came quickly, curiously around me. They were around me in, sort of in a horseshoe design. Had I held out my arms at full length, I would have touched the nearest ones on either side. And they were about three, four deep all around. And the first thing that got to me was the intensity of how they were staring at me. The eyes just raked from head to foot. The foreheads were furrowed in the intensity of their staring. And I felt very, very discomforted being stared at as if I was a thing or something. And the first thing that got to me was I began to have now another feeling. It was also in me, and yet it seemed apart. It was visceral, as if my inserts were going to churn around or something. I felt almost nauseous. And I remember standing up there thinking to myself, what in the world is the matter with you? And what came to me was that I had been in crowds lots of times in my life. But for the first time in my life, I was in a crowd, and I was the only one of my complexion, which might be said to be brown. Everybody else I was looking at was jet black. And emotionally, that thing hit me like a thunderbolt. I, to this day, don't know the components of why I felt as I did. And you know, it, it's sort of like body English. If we are insecure, uncertain, whatnot, we tend to drop our glances. And I dropped mine. And without having intended to do so, I found myself looking almost studying my own hands, the color of my hands, inside, outside, and naturally, involuntarily, it's in contrast with their complexions. And this time, it didn't take so much time. I had this rolling wave of a feeling come over me. It was just terrible, awful. I felt hybrid. I felt impure among the pure, and it was just awful. I remember standing there being rocked by that when the old man left the interpreters and briskly walked away, at which point all the people around me quickly left me and went to the old man. One of the interpreters, his name was Salah, came up and spoke quickly, whispering sort of in my ear. And what he said rocked me as much as the rest when I understood the import of it. He said, why they stare at you so, they have never in this place seen a black American. And I suddenly realized they were not looking at me as Alex Haley, writer, individual, as I tend to think of myself, but they were seeing me through their eyes as the symbol of the 25 plus millions of us black people in this country whom they had never seen. And it was just awesome to realize that someone had imputed to you that enormity of symbolism. Well, I was standing there kind of rocked by that when just sort of adjacent were now all these people, 70 out of them, clustered around this old man. And they were darting glances at me, and there was intense conversation in Mandinka. And although I couldn't understand a syllable of it, yet in some way there's a universal language of gestures, nuances, inflections. And somehow I knew exactly what they were talking about. I knew they were trying to arrive at how did they feel collectively about me symbolizing to them all we black people in this country whom they never had seen. And there came a point when the old man turned and quickly as was his way, he walked right through the people. He walked right up to me, stood maybe a yard from me, his eyes piercing into mine, and he spoke in Mandinka as if he felt I instinctively ought to understand it, which of course I couldn't. And the translation came from the side. And once I understood the import of that translation or the words, 
I made a vow to myself that once I get this book and the film and everything all settled down pretty well, I am going to see these words put in some appropriate permanent location somewhere along the southern coast of this United States and along the western coast of Africa. The way that they decided they felt about me symbolizing to them all we black people in this country whom they never had seen. And the translation was, quote, Yes, we have been told by the forefathers that there are many of us from this place who are in exile in that place called America and in other places. And that was the way they felt about it. The old man, the griot, his name was Keba Kanga Fofana. He had 73 reigns, their way of saying 73 years of age, one reign a season a year. He began now to tell me the history of the Kinte clan. I should tell you that one of the most awesome things I have since come to try and deal with was that if, and this particular if ought to be in letters six feet high because it is so rarely possible because of intervening occurrences, nonetheless, if any black person in this auditorium, any black person in this country only could know a few vital clues, if he or she only could know what was the original African name of the forefather the four parents brought out of Africa, if he or she only could know when were they brought out and from where were they brought out, that to this day it is not impossible that the contemporary black American might be put in touch with a wizened old griot somewhere in backcountry black West Africa who could tell the contemporary black American literally the ancestral clan from whence he or she sprang if they could know those clues. I was there, blessed to know the things I had gotten through a series of miracles which had begun on a West Tennessee front porch from my grandmother and other elder relatives. And now I was about to hear the story of the Kinte clan because I had been able to say, as had been the case, that my forefather in this country always had insisted his name was Kinte. I should tell you that when a griot begins to speak, it's a neo-religious occasion within a village. The people get in a wide semicircle. Their posture is something kind of like parade rest. The griot sits. He comes forward. As he begins to speak, he bends forward. His torso is rigid. The cords stand out in his neck. He speaks, and the words are almost as if a scroll is being read. He would say two or three sentences and the interpretation or translation would come to me. When I had heard a good fair amount of it, I was absolutely awed, immersed in just wonder that such could be, that out of this man's memory and his mouth was coming such an incredible array of lineage. All the way across a family line a hundred odd years ago, who married whom, what children in what order, all the way across that line, then drop back down to the children themselves, each child whom they had married, their children in what order, all the way across. I was struck by the biblical way it was being expressed in the translations, and so-and-so took as a wife so-and-so, and begot, and begot, and begot, and every now and then when he would name some begot or other, he would tell some little thing about that person which had happened later in life. I can strip out of the hours I was to hear that day uh, into a few minutes the history that I was to hear of the Kinte clan, and I again remind that the counterpart of this history exists this day is somewhere in backcountry black West Africa for every single black American their ears, if he or she only could know the clues and only could be put in touch with the right griot. He said that the Kinte clan had been begun in the country called Old Mali. The men preponderantly were blacksmiths. The women were mostly potters and weavers. A branch of that clan had moved into the country called Mauritania. And it was out of Mauritania that one son of that clan, his name 
Kariba Kunta Kinti, had come. He was a young marabou, which is to say a holy man of the Muslim faith. The people of that section, as I've said, historically were predominantly Muslim of faith. Kariba Kunta Kinti, as a young marabou, moved down into the long, narrow country called the Gambia. He stopped first in a village called Pakalinding. And then he went to a village called Jifarong. And he went next to a village called Jufare. In the village of Jufare, he took his first wife, a Mandinka maiden whose name was Cyrene. And by Cyrene, he begot two sons whose names were Jane and Salome. Then, Muslim man, plural marriages, he took a second wife, her name Yesa. And by Yesa, he begot a son whose name was Omaro. The three sons grew up there in the village of Jufare, and when they came of age, the elder two, Jane and Saloum, went away and founded a new village called Kinte Kunda Jane Ya. And then the youngest of them, Omaro, stayed there until he had 30 reigns, 30 years of age. Then he took a wife. Her name was Binta Keba. And by Binta Keba, within the decade that we in our calendar system would call roughly between 1750 and 1760, Omaro Kinte begot four sons, who in the orders of their arrival were named Kunta, Lamin, Suwadu, and Madi. The old man had been talking for about in excess of two hours when he got down to that level of the family. Then as he had stopped, I would suppose, 50 times it would seem, in the course of that time, to tell some little tangential thing about some individual, some begot or other. He stopped now and he spoke, and the translation came from the side. And I heard in disbelief, it began about the time the king's soldiers came. And I interject to tell you, that's one of those time-fixing references which griot storytellers use to fix events. They use events to fix dates. And if you would know the event, you must find the date. But anyway, here in backcountry black West Africa, hearing the ancestral story of the Kinte clan told because I had been able to come saying my forefather had always insisted that was his name. Now I heard this wizened old griot say through the interpreter, quote, about the time the king's soldiers came, the eldest of these four sons, Kunta, went away from this village to chop wood, and he was never seen again. And he went on with his story. Well, I sat there as if I was carved of rock. Goose pimples that felt to be the size of grapes all over me. There was no way in the world for that man to know what he had said to me. It was with physical effort that I got my hand into my duffel bag and got out my little notebooks. The first book, the early part of it, was devoted to a kind of a synthesis of what Grandma and Aunt Liz and Cousin Georgia and Aunt Viney and all of them had said. And I showed it to the interpreter, Salah, and I watched as he read and he began to perceive the meaning of it. And he got very agitated. He went to the old man, talking very rapidly, explaining to him. The old man, after a point, all but grabbed the book jabbing his finger at his pages, talking very rapidly to the people, explaining the significance that I had come from a place where my forebear on this side had been one who always said his name was Kente, who had always said he was not far from his village, chopping wood with the intent to make a drum when he had been surprised, set upon, captured into slavery. I remember I had been sitting on a little three-legged stool with a cowhide top and I just felt like helium had been pumped into me. I popped up like a jack-in-the-box, just stood up. I don't remember anyone giving an order, I just remember subsequently becoming aware that those people, the 70 odd of them, had formed a circle, a ring around me. They were sort of dancing, it might be said, of kind of hitching progress dance, counterclockwise, the movement's kind of like drum major, it's the high knee action. They were chanting something, their voices alternately loud and soft, 
and I'm standing there in the middle of them, feeling like an atom in the desert. How could you feel? I felt wiped out. And I remember I happened to be looking right toward the face of one of the about 12 ladies in that moving circle who had little infants over their back the way they carry them in those claws, as this lady with a fierce scowl on this shinola black face broke from the circle, charging in toward me, her bare feet knocking up little puffs of dust, and when she got to me, she took her infant and all but thrust it at me, the gesture saying, take it, and I took it, and I clasped it the way we instinctively do babies. And as soon as I had it clasped pretty good, she all but snatched it away from me, and there stood another lady with her baby. And it went on. I suppose it took about two minutes for me to hug all those babies. I would be back in this country, speaking at Harvard University, and a very famous scholar in this country, Dr. Jerome Bruner, who knows of such things, said later to me, you were participating in, and you did not know it, one of the oldest ceremonies of humankind called the laying on of hands, that in their way they were saying to you, through this flesh, which is us, we are you and you are us. And there were many, many other things that were going to happen that day in that village, almost too emotional to try and deal with. One I remember was the men took me to their mosque. I didn't know what to do. I'm Methodist, they are Muslim, and I was trying to be careful to do the right thing, watching out of the corner of my eye. You take off your shoes to go in there, you're down on your knees. And I remember down there on my knees feeling so forlorn and lost and thinking, I found out where I've come from, I don't even understand what they're saying. They were praying around me in this high nasal wailing Arabic. And later when we came out, the crux of what they were praying was translated for me. It was praise be to Allah for one lost long from us whom God has returned. And things just went on until it got to the fact that emotionally I could not handle anymore. I told them I wanted, if I could, to go out by land. We had come by water up the river, and it turned out it was long enough after the rainy season. It could be arranged. And I was going out now. It was set up. I would go out with a driver in a Land Rover. Back country, black West Africa. The monkeys, the incredible foliage the green parrots that streak around screaming at you. Just backcountry sight sounds that I'd never had any idea about because you just cannot describe Africa unless you've been there. And as we were going along, there was also in my mind a great turmoil. They begin to come in my head as we might have a dream, as when we sleep, a rough, ragged newsreel type of thing. It was as if all that I had read by now about the ways that Africans had been brought out of Africa seemed to be enacted. I began to see the way that along in the coastal areas, as had been the case with Kunta, mostly they were people who were kidnapped because they were close to the coast. But further back inland, I began to see the way that by far most of the slaves were captured, come screaming awake at night with the thatch roofs of their homes falling in on them, a fire, a flame, the thatch was in flames, and they would rush out into the bedlam, into the carnage, and those who survived it in any kind of fit shape were captured as prisoners, linked neck to neck with thongs into what were called coffles. If you do much reading in this, you will run into that word coffles, C-O-F-F-L-E-S. It is said that some coffles of slaves were as much as a mile in length, and they would begin those torturous marches from wherever the villages were down toward the areas where the ships were. And when they got down, with many dying along the way for many reasons, and when they got to the shoreline area, the survivors were herded into long, low buildings built of small timbers and thatched roofs called barracoons. In the barracoons, they would be washed, they would be fed, almost force-fed, they would be crudely medicated to hurry them toward a fit physical condition. When it was considered that they were in sufficient condition, now a few at a time, they would be moved out into the yards of the barracoons, 
And there the owners of the ships would come, the captains and the mates, and there would ensue these hideous physical examinations, every orifice of the human body, and then the purchases, and then the branding, usually between the shoulder blade, usually with the initial of the ship that was going to take them out. And then would come the time, as I pictured it in my mind's eye from things I'd read, that they were being moved from the barracoon across that strip of beach to the little cockle shell canoes at the edge of the water. And when these Africans from the inland areas, many of whom had never seen the sea, they were terrified. Those who saw the surf march up the beach, to them it was the jaws of some incomprehensible animal. They'd never seen anything like that. A ship lying offshore was to them a floating, flying house or something like that. They didn't even know what a ship was. It seemed it was when those Africans were being moved from Barracoon toward the canoes that for the first time they began to perceive the enormity of the unknown that was in store for them because it was on that beach that I had read so many times that so many of them who up to this time had been virtually stoic went into absolute spasms of terror. They would fall prone on the beach they were groveling, they were screaming. They would use their fingers like claws digging into the sand. They would use their necks and heads like the beaks of giant birds, trying to bite up one last hold on the land that was their own. And they were beaten up from that, beaten down across the further beach onto and into those canoes that took them out through the surf, out to the ships. And it was into the holds of those ships that they were put. And that was how the ancestors of every black person in this country without exception were brought here. There were no exceptions. There was no other way. And I was riding along with my head so full of this when we came to a big village up ahead. And I looked up ahead and I was astounded to realize that those people up there knew what had happened behind us in the village of Jufere. Obviously they knew. Obviously someone had come out and the news had relayed ahead of it before I had left. Because ahead of us now, there were poles staked along the road. There were green liana vines hanging like the cords from microphones, but thicker. And at the intervals along these vines hung the great glossy green saboa leaves that the Africans or Gambians use for sunshades or umbrellas. And the people were thronging out into the road, milling, waving. We could see them as we approached. And they were crying out some cacophony of sound. And we came on the driver slowing down. When he finally got to the people, I guess he was doing then maybe two miles an hour. And we were trying to nudge, he was, through the people who were all jostling and crowding around. I didn't know what to do. Again, I felt this full of helium feeling. I just stood up again like a jack-in-the-box, now in the Land Rover. And I'm looking down at these people, these people who are jet black all around, wizened elders and all ages and sizes and whatnot. And it came to me, looking at them staring up at me as they waved, what a huge caprice it was. There they were looking at me, seeing me as the symbol, of all we 25 plus million black people over here, and I, in turn, am using, in effect, our eyes looking at them, seeing people who have never left Africa since the beginning of man, so far as we know. And the huge caprice was that the only reason either of us was in either place was that caprice of which of our forefathers had happened to be taken out of Africa and which had been left there. That was the only reason either of us was in either locale. And I was full of that going on in among those people when I suppose we had gotten about a third of the way through them. And I suddenly began to understand what it was that they all were crying out. I think I hadn't understood it because I didn't understand their tongue and they were all closely clustered and I didn't get anything but the wall of sound as opposed to the individual sounds. But it began to come to me now that what they were all crying out from wizened old elders, the men, the old grandmothers with skin like leather,
their breasts like old bell straps, the childbearing women, many of them pregnant, the maidens, the youth, and the little youngsters, jaybird naked of both sexes. They were all milling, thronging, looking up at me with beaming, bullion expressions on their faces. And what they were crying out, which I had not understood now, until now, was Mr. Kinte, Mr. Kinte. And I tell you what, I am a man, but I remember when a sob hit me about ankle level, I remember throwing my hands up to my face, my fingers, and shrieking, crying. I don't think I ever cried like that since I was a little baby. It just seemed to me that if one really knew the story of black people, if one knew the way that our forefathers had been brought here, that it really didn't matter what one thought about black people individually or collectively, but it just seemed that as a human being, one ought to weep that that thing called slavery had ever happened in the annals of human being, and I just couldn't help it. I wept on out through that village and all the way, more or less, until we got back to that car, and I got myself onto a flight back to New York. And when I got there, I found that it took me a while to get used to being back. About half a day that I couldn't even call my own people. And then I called my brother, George. And he told me the sad news that while I was away, cousin Georgia had died in Kansas City. My brother's a lawyer, he's very orderly, and he brought me a folder with the data about the funeral. Then it included the hospital report, and on there was time of death. And I went the way I sort of fiddle around with the information, and I made the time transfer from Kansas City to West Africa. And then it hit me like a thunderbolt when suddenly I realized what had in fact happened, that as the last survivor among them all, Cousin Georgia, the youngest who had told the story to me and to whom I had gone back several times since our reunion because she was so, my source of strength, my source of support, my source of story, my source of history, and now it seemed that as the last survivor, one of the reasons that I have to feel that this whole thing was meant to be was that the time transfer or the transposition of the time zones from Kansas City to West Africa showed that Cousin Georgia had died literally within the hour that I had stepped foot in that village in Africa. And it always since has seemed to me that as that last survivor, it was her role to see me to that village where the link across the ocean in the family story would be made. And then Cousin Georgia, too, went on and joined the rest to watch me and see what would I do with it. It was a charging moment and of a kind of motivation that it is hard to put to words. I got myself together emotional enough to go to the publishers, and I told them the story of what had happened. I told them that actually I wanted to write a book that technically would be the story of a family, my own, but which broadly would really be the saga of a people, that every black person, it does not matter who he or she is, ancestrally, traces back to some African born and reared in some village, captured in some way, put into some ship, brought across the same ocean into some succession of plantations. And I told them that what I wanted to do now was write a book that would be the symbol story, the saga of all black people. And it would be a book called Roots. I told them that we had to have, I had to have, what we call in the writing business, saturation research. And they said they understood. 
It meant that I would try to bring every possible thing to this book, every avenue of research, everything I could commit myself to. And what intrigued me now, and it was because of my Coast Guard background, was the ship that had brought Kunta over. I had some clues. When I was a little boy, Grandma and the others always had said that ship brought him to Naples, they would pronounce it. There was no place they could possibly have been talking about but Annapolis, Maryland. It was at that time I did a little quick reading, a burgeoning young city vying for supremacy as a port with Baltimore. Numerous ships came in and out of Annapolis, some of them slave ships on occasion. I had another clue, and that was that now I knew where the African Kunta Kinte had come from, the Gambia River. And the next thing I needed to know was about when had this ship sailed. And I had a clue for that too, as the old Grio had said, prefacing his story of Kunta Kinte, he had said about the time the king's soldiers came. And I had to find out what was he talking about. He had obviously been talking about some kind of military thing. I went now to London, got on a plane, flew over there, and I went searching. This was my first experience in heartbreaking research. I searched and searched, and it finally, I think it took me about six weeks, sifting through records before in the British parliamentary records, I found that there was a group called Colonel O'Hare's forces. His name was Colonel Charles O'Hare, who had been sent with 30 odd men from London to the Gambia River to guard the then British-held Fort James Slave Fort. There was no question, but that was what the Griot had referred to. It had occurred in early 1767, so this gave me a time frame. It had to have been around in that area of time that Kunta had been captured. Now I begin another search the incredibly involved, the incredibly difficult, and incredibly frustrating search for what ship was it? I went to Lloyd's of London. The fact that I'd been in the Coast Guard 20 years was helpful with any maritime people. I finally got to a very high official, and I remember I was talking with this man, and he was sitting behind his desk, and I remember his eyes kind of falling, in a way that made me kind of look down and I realized I'd never had realized I was just tears draining down on my shirt as I poured out of me. The passion, the fervor, the drive of trying to pull together the history of a people. And finally the man stood up, his name was Mr. R. C. E. Landers. And he said, young man, Lords of London, we'll do all we can to help you. And it was he and they who began to open up to me doors to places where there are records of slave ships. There are more records of slave ships than one would dream. It seems inconceivable until you reflect that for 200 years ships sailed carrying cargoes of slaves. And there are boxes of them, the records, which have never even been opened. Nobody's had occasion particularly to go into them lately. And anyway, to compress I worked for about seven solid weeks. Finally, I was in the 1,023rd set of slave ship records in the public records office in London. One afternoon, going down across this sheet that had 30 ships' movements on it. And I went on down and my eye came to number 18, all of it in this old-fashioned handwriting. You have to adjust to it my eye would go out to the right as it had with endless, endless before cases of the same thing. And I looked out and there was destination Annapolis. And somehow it didn't really grab me at the moment. I remember I took the little information, picked up the records, went back and turned them in properly and went on out. Around the corner from the public records office is a little tea and cruller shop. I got me some tea and a cruller, and I was sitting there sort of sipping the tea and swinging my foot, 
like it's all in the days work, when it suddenly hit me, maybe I had indeed found that ship. I still owe that lady for that tea and crawler. <laughs> I went out of there like a shot. I got to a telephone and called. I got the last available seat on the six o'clock flight to New York. And I got on that plane that night. There was not even time to go back to the hotel to get my stuff if I was to make that flight, and I didn't go back. And I flew that ocean that night, sitting up, sleepless, seeing in my mind's eye the book I had to get my hands on. I could see it. I'd had it in my hands. I had a light brown back, dark brown letters, shipping in the port of Annapolis by Vaughn W. Brown. I got to New York, took the shuttle flight to Washington, Library of Congress, got this book, flipping through it, there was one line in agotype that tended to support. That was, in fact, the ship. And I just about went berserk. In time, I would get to the author of that book, Vaughn Brown. He was a broker in Baltimore. He dropped what he was doing. He left his office, got in his car. He drove to Annapolis. And he helped me pin down that was indeed the ship. I worked there in the Maryland Hall of Records, St. John's College campus, and different things, little bit here, little card file here. Phoebe Jacobson, a master archivist, helped me find things. And then the area widened. I was in New England at Peabody Museum, Widener at Harvard, various other places, moving around, and then I was crossing the ocean again. There was a one period when I made three round trips over the ocean in a 10-day period. It never occurred to me to telephone or to cable. I had to go. Somebody might miss it. You had to go. And it was pulling together a shred here, a little bit there, of about that ship, to recreate the ship which brought Kunta Kinte and which symbolized the ship are the ships which had brought so many, many, many out of Africa over such a long period of time. Finally, I got together. Her name was Lord Ligonier. She was named for a British field marshal. She was built in this country in 1765, probably in New Hampshire. She came out of Maryland and sailed with a cargo of rum, a skeletal crew of 16, her captain, Captain Thomas Davies, D-A-V-I-E-S, and she sailed to Graves in England. She was a brand new ship, maiden voyage. They sold the rum, used the proceeds to buy the slaving hardware and the foodstuffs they would need, and to put on a full crew, 36. And she sailed out of Graves Inn, and she was moving on up now on her way. I could read the captain's mind. He had a brand new ship. He'd been entrusted with command. He wanted to make the quickest possible trip to get the best possible cargo of slaves and get back to look good to the people who had entrusted him with such a command. And he's moving on up the channel. And as he moved on up, the weather began to grow bad. I was tracking her. There were different places. I could get the records of one thing about England, it gave us the greatest system of civil service. And one thing about civil servants is they're always writing something. And there are records on in. And the records would let me track her. She was making pretty good time. She was doing about 5.2 knots. I could see her in my mind's eye. She was of ship rig. Her timbers were Hackmatack cedar. Her planking was loblolly pine. The flax in her sails was grown in New Jersey. The nails that held her together were not really nails as we know them, but they were called trunnel, tree nails, dowel pegs of black locust split in the top with a wedge of white oak, and it will outlast an iron fastening. And she was moving on up that coast, and she was doing good, and then I came upon the thing that for God's sake she dropped the anchor. And I nearly had a fit. Why on earth would he drop the anchor? I knew the man was trying to make a good, fast trip. And it threw me into a dither. Why did she stop? And I begin to think now that ships then 
had no engines. All ships were sail ships. So if I was to know why she stopped as well as why she went, what I had to know was more than I knew about weather. So I dropped everything. I found out the British Meteorological Headquarters is in a city called Bracknell, England. And I got on a train, went over there. I remember it was a Thursday afternoon. You get off the train, there's a little rise, and then a high iron wall and a big gate. And I got in through that gate about half an hour before they closed. And I remember rushing in there and telling these people, look, I have got to have this weather for the spring, summer, 1766. And they looked at me as if I was crazy. <laughs> and I just couldn't understand why did not they have what I had to have. <laughs> there was no question but what I had to have it. And I went back to London that night as deep in despair as I had been up to that point. When I got back to the hotel, I got a hold of the little bellman. They say a hotel bellman can get you anything. <laughs> and this, I don't drink much, but this time I told this fellow I had to have a bottle of, I didn't care what. <laughs> he got me a bottle of that Puerto Rican rum that looks like molasses. I don't know where he got it from. And by morning it was gone. Well, it was three days before I was functional again, and it was a good thing. I felt as if I was a total failure if I couldn't find uh, what I had to know, why did that ship stop? And then I got to thinking about something, I guess Linus Blanket for me, kind of, is grandma. Long gone she is, but whenever I get in any strain, my mind goes back to my grandma. I'm very close to anybody's grandma because it symbolized my own. And when I got to thinking about grandma in this little hotel, then I got to thinking about Henning, the town in which we lived, and then about how our town was structured around its church and its school, all little southern towns are. And I got to thinking about some about church in particular was that among our congregation at New Hope CME Church, was a lady named Sister Will Ada Curry. And everybody in Henning knew that Sister Will Ada was the best prayer in town. There was no question. After church, every Sunday when I grew up, I don't know how this thing started, but it grew up with me. Sister Will Ada always wore a dress to church that had two big pockets, one on either side. And after church, out in the churchyard, people moving around as they do, Rather in the spirit that people today will go drop a coin in a fountain for good luck or something, with Sister Will Ada, people would sort of sidle up by her, and all they do is make certain she saw who they were, and they'd drop a nickel in one of these pockets. And the general feeling about it was that meant you would be included in her general weekly prayer, and it couldn't hurt. You know. Now, if somebody had a particular problem, they would let her see it was a dime and <laughs> drop in there. And, and if it was something catastrophic, you'd give her a quarter. And that meant you had a pipeline, sort of. Well, I got to thinking about that, laying up in this little room in a hotel in London. And I knew it was crazy, and yet everything else was crazy, it seemed. And it seemed hopeless. And I got on the phone. It is an experience to hear an international operator going through, getting through to the United States in the first place, information, getting Henning, Tennessee, and finally getting the phone number of Will Ada Curry. I knew she was still there, hadn't seen her in so long. Finally, she's on the phone. We are on the phone. It didn't take very long for me to establish who I was. Of course, she knew me as soon as I got straight which young and I was. Then, she was confused about, she wasn't quite sure what London was, but she knew it was somewhere across the water. And we got that settled. And then I recalled what she used to do, and she said, yes, and I still does that. And then I told her, I said, Sister Will Ada, I'm over here, and I need a big prayer. Honey, I mean, I need a big prayer. <laughs> and so she listened, and then I told her, I said, Sister Will Ada, when we get done, I'm going to send you $100. And she never blinked. She said, son, 
it sure is good talking with you, but you hang up, because I'm going to start right now. And <laughs> I don't know exactly what she prayed, but I'll tell you what happened. An idea came to me. I got to thinking that I needed to get any kind of valid weather data that I could document between April and September 1766 in that strip of ocean between the English Channel and the Gambia River. I went and got me a big blank meteorological chart, figured just mark that strip of ocean that any ship sailing that particular destination would have to go through. And now I begin to get on to trains and go to every city in England that in the 1760s had been a major seaport, Liverpool, Hull, the others. And when I'd get off the train, I'd go in those cities to everything that looked like a library. This was when I began to strike up what I like to think of now as a love affair with librarians. I discovered something about librarians that most people, I think, take librarians pretty much for granted take libraries themselves pretty much for granted. But I found out that if you can excite a librarian, if you can make a librarian share your passion for something you've got to find, they can turn detective and do things that neither you nor they would normally think. Once I could get them to understand what I was trying to do, librarians got really excited about what I was trying, and they sent me to places which are now like a blur in the memory, old warehouses old shipping record places, homes of seafaring people who had collected logs of ships, all kinds of places. And I would go and I always I was looking for one thing, the log of any ship of any kind, which at any time between April and September 1766 had been in my strip of ocean. And I knew one thing, of having been an old sailor and having done a lot of work in old ship records, that in the days of sailing ship, every time they change the watch on a ship, they record the longitude and the latitude and the weather. And whenever I'd find in any of these logs a ship that had been in my strip of ocean in those months, I would pluck out the longitude, latitude, and with my little stuff I could pinpoint where she was when she made a specific weather reading. And I could reduce that weather reading to the symbols. And in that way, Three weeks about, I had 411 weather readings scattered over that strip of ocean. I went back to Bracknell and got two lieutenant commanders, Royal Navy, and showed it to them, and they became engrossed with it. It was like a double cross-stick puzzle. And then they went in with colleagues and with the modern weather prognosis methods, they were able to recreate the weather in which the Lord Ligonier had sailed. I found that the reason she had dropped anchor was a very valid one. She'd been coming out of Gravesend and the weather had been getting worse on her and she came to that point where you have to make a starboard turn and where it needed east in the wind to make that turn safely. But the wind had shifted to southwest. She had to drop the anchor because if she hadn't, she would have been in danger of drifting over into an area called the Goodwin Sands. And she laid in there waiting for the wind to shift. And she waited and waited until finally, it was July 5th, 1766. She was in eight fathoms of water. It was a Tuesday morning. The Miller Bar reading was 1010. The weather was a drizzle becoming fair and the wind shifted east northeast. And that was the day she ran up the sails. She went on down now past Shakespeare Cliff past the White Cliffs of Dover, Dungeness, Bealey Head, down to Lizard's Head, and into the open sea. She went southeastly across the Bay of Biscay, down to the Cape Verdes, the Canaries, and then she made the bend upwards and came up to the Gambia River. She would spend the next 10 months in that Gambia River slaving. At the end of 10 months, she had a cargo 3,265 elephants' teeth, as they called ivory tusks, 3,700 pounds of beeswax, 
800 pounds of raw cotton, 32 ounces of gold, 140 Africans. And with that cargo, she set sail July 5th, 1767. It was a Sunday. She sailed directly to Annapolis. She arrived in Annapolis, and when she got in there, I knew of her coming in there because I went now to Annapolis, and I went into one set of records that you can generally find back to the time of Christ, and that's tax records, to find out, <laughs> to find out what had she declared for tax when she got in there. The captain was very honest. He declared everything that he declared on leaving the fort in the Gambia River, the James Fort whose ruins I had seen, he now declared in Annapolis everything there but the original 140 Africans had become 98 who had survived the voyage, which was about average for slave ships. Another little interesting side thing I happened to sort of stumble upon in the course of the research was that percentage-wise, more whites' crew died on slave ships than slaves did. The Lord Ligonier would bear it out. She had left England with a full crew of 36, and she arrived in Annapolis with 18 of them alive. At that time, I knew that if you had cargo as valuable as slaves to sell, then as now, one would advertise. And I went now looking for the records of the media of the day. I went into the microfilm records of the Maryland Gazette, the issue of October 1st, 1767, page three, the far left column, the third ad down, there was the Lord Ligonier's ad placed by its agents, that she had, quote, just arrived from the river Gambia with fresh slaves to be sold the following Wednesday. And then that auction was held. Now I had one thing left to pin down beyond any question that the miracle indeed had been achieved through the help of God. That's the only way I can feel about it. I had to be able to pin down that without question that was the same African I'd heard about. And my clue now went back to the front porch in Henning, Tennessee, that always Grandma and Aunt Liz and Cousin George and Aunt Plus and Aunt Viney and all of them would talk about this African always had rejected the name Toby, which he had been given by his master. And I knew that they had always said that Massa John Waller bought him off the ship. And later, after his foot had been cut off, Massa William Waller, the brother of John, had bought him from his brother. It was oral history kept down across generations of a black family in America. And I had had things now which tended to make me put great reliance in what Grandma had said. I didn't doubt it at all anymore, but the thing was try and document it. I went now to Richmond, Virginia, and got again into that experience of working in that world of the old-fashioned handwriting, the Fs like Ss. I'm working now in the longhand legal deeds of the 1760s, Spotsylvania County, Virginia. And I searched and searched and searched, and I believe it was in the fourth week that I found what I had been looking for. There it was, a deed dated September 5th, 1768. Kunta Kinte by that time would have been 11 months in this country, a colonial America. And there was a deed, Spotsylvania County, Virginia, between William Waller on the one part and John Waller and his wife on the other, transferring from John and his wife Anne to William goods. The first page dealt with the transfer of 240 odd acres of land, the fences and other things on that land. And then on the second page, I think it was about the fifth line down, between two commas, were the words, quote, and also one Negro man slave named Toby. And that brought it full circle. There was no question. It was gulpy. It was my God time. The rest of the research, I could stand up here six hours, I guess, and talk, but I'm not going to do that. 
it would just be telling about what happened in the way of the research, the drama, the adventure of it, across nine years, finally to flesh out the book that took another three years to write, the book called Roots. I learned, I've tried to share with people a lot about the history of black people. And when I got myself very aware of the history of black people, I began to reflect upon how little I had known at the outset. What a hoax I felt had been pulled on me by many forces, that I had gotten to be a grown man and knew next to nothing about my own people, that all I had known about Africa, the ancestral culture of us had, as I say, been drawn from Tarzan, Jungle Jim sort of things, and that I knew little about slavery, really. And then I got to reflecting that if this had been the case with me, what did I know about other people? And I just got curious, me black, but me human being, about other peoples. So what I began to do was just for me to go into the libraries, with which I'm pretty familiar by now, and just do a little peripheral study about virtually every ethnic group of the peoples who comprise the population of this United States of America. And what I begin to discover, and what collectively I know has enriched me as few things I have, at least so I feel, is that it does not matter who they are, from whence they came, but every single ethnic group in this country, if you go back and you study and you know about that group of people in whatever was their old country, their trials, their problems, their tribulations, their frustrations, in some cases persecutions, if you know about the hope, the beacon that America represented, about the time they came to the immigrant generation, and then the generation that got here and assimilated, that what you deal with, with every ethnic group on the face of this country, is a thrilling, stirring human drama in this nation of immigrants in which black people happen to be the only unwilling immigrants. None of us ever must forget that blacks were the only ones who came here in chattel slave status and in chains in this nation of immigrants. And then I reflected about how it seems to me that all of us, every one of us, it does not matter who, have a stake in something that I thought to be one of the most stirring, moving, dramatic, heart-rending things I came upon in the study of the culture of Africa for the book Roots. And that was the thing that had to do with how the babies were named. In this land that we have all heard about as heathens and savages peopling it, that in this land, 200, 300, 400 years ago, in any little village, when a baby was born, the people of the village would not see much of the father for seven days because he was occupied with going about, keeping pretty much to himself, thinking up a good, meaningful, significant name for this infant. And bear in mind, these are these heathens and savages we've heard so much about, and that these babies are the ancestors of we black people here today. On the eighth day, the people of the village would gather at that particular little circular mud-walled home with the thatch roof. And there would be a stool sitting just outside. The people brought with them, in the Mandinka culture anyway, a jolly bar, a drummer, who brought a cylindrical drum called the tantang. And then they had another man there who was the equivalent of our minister. They called him the Alemamo. And the jolly bar would give a roll on his drum, and the people would stand rigidly at attention. A second roll on the drum, and the mother, who had been inside waiting for that signal, now would step out and sit herself on this stool, holding the little eight-day-old black infant, these heathens and savages. The third roll on the drum, and the Ali Mama would step forth and 
bless the gathering, because this had happened to everybody there when they were eight days of age. And then the next role, the father, would come from the bush. He was waiting somewhere just for this signal. And now this father would walk over with every eye on him, his fellow villagers, his neighbors, his tribesmen, and he would walk over to where the mother sat holding this little eight-day-old infant. And the father now would bend, and he would lift up this infant, and he would turn it so that one of its ears was very close to his lips. And into that tiny ear, that father would whisper the name he had selected three times. And the thinking of these alleged heathens and savages in doing it this way was that the individual thus named always would be the first to know who he was. Those are the ancestors of us as a people. And it seems to me that the symbolism for us all, having nothing to do with our race, whatever race we may be, but just us people as human beings, it seems to me the potential of us and the symbol for us is contained in the second part of the baby naming ceremony. And that was that night when the father now alone would take his infant a distance away from the village and he would hold it up so that its face, its eyes looked up toward the firmament, the stars and the moon. And the father would speak to his infant, again, the symbol for us all and our potentials they quote, behold the only thing greater than thyself. Thank you.